Good morning, everybody. I actually, good morning for us, good afternoon, good evening for our attendees in Africa and Europe. I decided to try and learn greetings from all the different parts of the continent you come from. I must confess my ambition was larger than my capabilities at such an early hour. So I will save it for the Serengeti Lounge where you can all teach us the proper salutations for your language and culture. For the time being, I will greet one or three participants in this session and say, Masquera se habarizaleo. After the lovely opening session yesterday, I'm pleased to announce that today we get down to the foundations of the subject of weapons of mass destruction. Our illustrious, illustrious panel consists of Dr. Ferenc Delnaki Veris. I don't know how to pronounce it properly, so I'm sure Dr. Ferenc will give you a good um, run by of that. And we have Dr. George Moore, who will talk about radiological dispersal devices as weapons of mass disruption. And we also have uh, Ms. Jill Luster from our CNS Biological and Chemical Weapons as our Chemical Weapons Specialist. So starting with Dr. Ferenc, he is a scientist in residence and adjunct professor. He won a Nobel Prize in Physics in collaboration with others for his work on neutrinos. In Monterey, one of his areas of focus is on the proliferation of fissile materials nuclear spent fuel management, emerging technologies, and verification of nuclear weapons. He is the brains and creativity behind the videos you were supposed to watch before the session. Ferenc, the floor is yours. Hey, so, um, so my name is Ferenc Danica Veres. Uh, just call me Ferenc, that's the easiest. Um, I'm a scientist in residence and adjunct faculty at uh, CNS uh, at MIS. Um, so first of all, thank you for the organizers for inviting me. It's really great pleasure for me to be part of this very important course. I've looked at the list of the participants and most of you have a great technical background in the nuclear field, which is just amazing. Um, I'm sure many of you will actually be familiar with the material I present, um, but I hope you still find it, especially the professors who teach this, uh, find it interesting from a, maybe a pedagogical point of view. However, some of you do not have a technical background in the nuclear area. So there's some introductory material that I hope is also useful for you. So um, I'll be focusing on nuclear weapons and nuclear weapon effects. Um, the way I organized it was like a bookshelf <laughs> with the main content about nuclear weapons and effects sandwiched between two bookends. So one bookend aims to put nuclear weapons into context. And I realize you'll have other lectures about this. And um, while the other bookend discusses, that's the other end, uh, discusses recentish. 2009, 2011, uh, it's not so recent anymore, research on the climactic effects of a small nuclear exchange. Um, the effects are catastrophic for all nations and even for nations that have nothing to do with nuclear weapons or the exchange. Therefore, all nations have to work together to remove the threat of nuclear weapons. So that's the last bookend. So the first bookend is putting nuclear weapons into context. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, so the graph above is the minutes to midnight on the doomsday clock. It's a measure of how close we are to doomsday or say global catastrophe uh, with respect to twin catastrophes. One that is happening, which is climate change, and the other which may occur if we don't stop it, which is further nuclear weapon use. Then with the six nuclear techniques, you can kind of see how it kind of jumps back and forth over the years. So you see 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and so on and so on. Uh, but then with the six nuclear tests conducted by North Korea, worsening tensions with the Russian Federation and the United States, the clock has been steadily getting closer to midnight in a kind of logarithmic curve. And in 2021, this is where we are now, which is very high up. Um, and so here is a video of the announcement uh, of the time when the doomsday clock was announced in 2020. That was the last assessment I'm not gonna play it just for the interest of time, but if the, the videos that I, um, uh, that I produced, you'll see, you'll see the video of where um, Rachel Bronson was the pres president of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists uh, announced the hands of the doomsday clock. And I think it's now 100 seconds before midnight. So why are we concerned in 2021? Well, we see rising tension between China, India, India, Pakistan, US, Russia, US, China, all countries that, that have nuclear weapons. All countries are also modernizing nuclear weapons with the United States introducing a new low yield nuclear weapon, 
North Korea constantly introducing new weapons and new, new weapon delivery systems, new missiles and so on. There's also sustained interest in fissile material production. Iran is enriching to higher levels um, and producing better centrifuges. The other thing is that there's a fading memory of what happened with the detonation of the atomic bombs. It's now been 75 years, years and I always have a fear that people forget how horrible these bombs were. Um, there's also a possible interest in nuclear testing by the former Trump administration, former Trump administration. Um, the US has accused U, uh, China and Russia of low yield nuclear tests. Um, hopefully the rhetoric will be toned down in the Biden administration. And finally, our luck with, you know, quick thinking people to prevent nuclear, nuclear catastrophes may simply run out. And that's the other thing that, that I always think about is that we're kind of playing with dice here in terms of, um, you know, we've been lucky so far, but maybe our luck is running out. So now to the meat of the presentation, uh, the books between the two bookends in this analogy. Uh, now, obviously it's completely impossible to have so much detail in a 20 minute presentation. So I've made several videos um, that describe the concepts in more detail. So I please urge you um, to look at the videos and then feel free to email me or ask me questions. Um, I put it in the chat box, my email address. So let's start at the beginning for those not so familiar with this. Radioactivity describes the property that some isotopes will over time decay, change from one isotope to another isotope. And when I'm talking about isotopes of an element, I mean atoms that have the same number of protons, which tags the element, but a different number of neutrons. Chemically, because they're the same element, all these isotopes, if you're looking, let's say, looking at hydrogen, so it would be uh, tritium, deuterium, and protium, um, they would behave the same in the chemical form, but not in the nuclear world. Each time that you get this transformation from one isotope to another isotope, which is kind of showing here to more stable isotope, a little bundle of energy, which is like a, like a particle is released. They shoot out like bullets and they can damage the human body and lead to long-term um, health effects. A useful analogy to think of decay is in terms of buckets. So that U-235 decays into isotope thorium-231. Um, it's got a very long half-life, 703 million years. So it, it's, a, it's a very, very thin spout that it goes into the thorium-231 bucket. But then the thorium-231 bucket has 25.5 hours. So it's a much thicker spout. So it goes into the next bucket. And you can kind of think about this in terms of buckets in a kind of nice way. Um, but these chains of decays of all these buckets can get to be very complicated with branching decays to uh, you know, different isotopes. I'm sure many of you guys know this. So let's talk about what I call the nuclear difference. Really the, the stark difference in energy from nuclear physics reactions compared to the chemical world or chemical energy. So one in 500 million decays of, this, uh, of uranium-235 don't decay by thorium-231, but actually decay by what's called spontaneous fission. And so what happens, uh, the nucleus splits into two different isotopes you know, different isotopes with the release of neutrons and gamma rays. And gamma rays are like energetic light particles, like energetic X-rays. Uh, and this is called spontaneous fission, um, but it's very rare compared to the dominant decay um, of thorium, uh, uh, thorium uh, 231. And here is what changed the world forever. Um, it was a discovery that U-235 actually splits when it's bombarded by other neutrons. So you don't have to wait for a very long time for it to split as I'm as I was showing before. Uh, and this led people to realize quickly that a chain reaction was possible. And of course, with it also nuclear weapons. Uh, Lisa Meitner did the important experiments that demonstrated that U-235 split, although she never received a Nobel Prize for it. There have only been, only been, believe it or not, three physics Nobel Prizes awarded to women. And the last one's Donna Strickland in 2018, to one before was 1963. So this is really quite dismal uh, when it comes to the record of giving Nobel Prize, no, physics Nobel Prizes to, to women. Okay, that's my beef. Um, so a fast nuclear chain reaction is when the neutron uh, fissions or splits the U-235. So through this induced uh, fission uh, reaction, that's what I was talking about before, induced fission. And it produces fission products, which are the isotopes that are left behind when it splits into two or three, uh, and these isotopes tend to be radioactive and this releases two or more neutrons. Those neutrons can then find other U-235 and split those, and then so on and so on and so on. 
each time you get a splitting, it does of course a little random walk. Um, the time it takes between splittings is about 10 nanoseconds or 10 to the minus eight seconds. And that they call a shake. Uh, crazy physicists call it shake. Um, and then if you think about it, first you have uh, one fission and then two fissions, then four, then eight, then 16, then 32. And as you have, have preceding generations, you get to the 80th generation. And then you get this number, which many of you will recognize, which is six times 10 to the 23 or Avogadro's number, which means that um, if we're looking at U U235 splitting, 235 grams has split and produced the energy equivalent of 80 generations. You then have two more splittings and you get to this number of 2.4 times 10 to the 24th uh, uh, fissions, uh, which corresponds to 940 grams. Um, and that's what I wanted you to kind of keep in mind. So you produce a lot of energy, all these little energies of 200 million electron volts, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot more than you would get from, uh, you know, from chemical energy that, that, that binds the um, atoms together into molecule millions of times more. Uh, it's a lot of energy when you all add it together. And you can do this quick back of the envelope calculation. If you have two to the exponent 81, that's equal to 2.4 times 10 to 24 fissions. And then if you take this fission as being 200 million electron volts per fission, and that's just a unit of energy, right? And then you can convert that to joules, a more familiar form of energy. Then you see that that's equivalent to 18 million kilograms of TNT. So let that sink in for a minute, equivalent to 18 million kilograms of TNT exploding. So that's an awful lot of energy that's in just one kilogram, um, which you're kind of showing here, it's four moles. So four times 235 grams is about one kilogram of uranium-235. And the other thing is the production of this energy happened very fast. You saw on the previous slide that I said a shake is about 10 nanoseconds. So if you have about 80 generations, which is equivalent to about 100, uh, 100 um, basically 100 generations, and it's 100 times uh, you know, 10 nanoseconds, that works out to be uh, one, one microsecond. So one millionth of a second, you produce all this energy and, um, you know, and it's got nowhere to go and so it explodes. So this is why I call the nuclear difference. So on the left side, I'm showing one kilogram of TNT exploding or 0 0.000050 and then a one uh, kilotons of TNT exploding. And on the right side is Hiroshima. Um, so when you see the stark difference between the energy scale of uh, one kilogram of TNT exploding compared to, and that's chemical energy, compared to one kilogram of uh, uranium-235 that's being used up, um, you can't blame people for wanting to access all that energy, whether it's for bombs or whether it's for uh, nuclear reactors. So even though we focus on the science, uh, don't forget the unspeakable horror because the science is fundamentally interesting. Um, so interspersed throughout the presentation, I will show you paintings that describe the horror. I always find it much more meaningful to show you paintings rather than pictures uh, of what happened. So a useful analogy is to think, think of this in terms of clamped mousetraps placed very close together with kind of ping pong balls on top. Those, those represent the neutrons. And when the mousetrap is unclamped, the ping pong balls fly off in all directions uh, and some will continue the chain reaction by unclamping um, the others. Uh, and you see the key to all this, that all this has to happen very fast. And here I show you an example of this. Oh, and I think I forgot when I did my screen sharing uh, the sound, so maybe the sound, sound will not work, which is a pity. But what you see here is uh, the ping pong ball going in and setting off all these mousetraps. So in a nutshell, this is really how a nuclear bomb essentially works. Um, the reckoned rapid and clamping of the mousetraps represents the fission of the fissile material uh, like uranium-235. But the question is, how, how is this actually done? Um, so what are nuclear weapons? Well, it's rapid assembly of nuclear explosive material into configuration that will sustain a fast neutron chain reaction. You need to have that speed. 
um, at least one neutron uh, released per fission produced to produce another fission. Uh, you need higher than a critical mass uh, in terms of the quantity. Uh, and to produce a nuclear explosion, the fast neutrons from each generation of fissions must produce more fast neutrons in the next generation. So there's really two ways that people, when they talk about nuclear weapons, um, how, to, how to assemble nuclear weapons, how to get to that supercritical mass. One way is specific to uranium-235, which is to assemble two pieces that are close to one half uh, critical mass, and then assembling them very fast by shooting one piece on top of the other into the other so that the two half pieces and in fact in in practice it's not really half it's even more than one half um are are you know uh are are, are, are assembled so you get to a critical mass this is known as what's called a gun type uh nuclear weapon um the bomb dropped on hiroshima was an example of this type of bomb and it's actually very simple as long as you have the fissile material to actually um, uh, assemble and produce these bombs. And there's a quote by a uh, famous uh, physicist uh, that said that uh, even a high school kid could do it as long as you have the, uh, the material at hand. However, this, will, this type of bomb will not work for plutonium-239 um, because it has too many neutrons being given off, which would cause it to fizzle, what's called a fizzle. So it wouldn't produce the, the yield that you that you would, that is desired. Um, so instead, an alternative way is to kind of implode a shell of plutonium, and there's you know different ways that people do this. Uh, plutonium or uranium two thirty five with explosives kind of had the rocket effect, where it, you know it goes off, and then you have an, also an implosion um, to compress the shell to reach a critical mass. So you start out with not at a critical mass, but once you once the the bomb explodes or implodes in this case you compress it into uh, reaching a critical mass. Uh, and this is called the implosion type method. And this is the method that state actors uh, would employ in their, uh, in their bomb designs. Now, these are calculations done by the, uh, National, uh, sorry, the National Resource Defense Council uh, on how much uh, fissile material, plutonium-239 or uranium-235, uh, is required for different uh, yield bombs. And it's important to note that the mass fissile material is much less than a significant quantity. Of course, the calculations above don't take into account losses from machining. However, the critical mass of a bomb that gives, say, one kiloton of TNT, as you can see there, uh, equivalent yield, can be done with only one kilogram of plutonium, rather than the eight kilograms, which is what is a significant quantity. So it's important to keep this in mind. Um, now, modern nuclear weapons are different. Um, they use uh, what's called boosting, where a deuterium tritium gas mixture is added to the bomb so that when the temperature gets high enough, so through the explosion process that you know, it produces a lot of uh, a very high temperature, um, the Ds and Ts will fuse and increase the efficiency of the bomb. So it's not really a fusion bomb, but rather the efficiency increases and so does the yield. One way to kind of look at this is that it gives a burst of neutrons at this assembly time and, and, the fission, and fissions the pieces that otherwise uh, would be lost. Now you can have very powerful thermonuclear bombs, uh, hydrogen bombs that produce thousands of kilotons TNT bombs or, or, or megatons. So way bigger than Hiroshima type bombs. Um, generally now they have, uh, you know, less yield bombs. They're not really megaton bombs. However, there's B-83 gravity bombs that are currently in the US uh, nuclear weapon arsenal is 1.2 uh, megaton TNT. I think that's probably the last one that has such an incredibly high yield. Um, these bombs use an implosion bomb to trigger an explosion in the fusion components of the bomb. So it's kind of two components, the primary and the secondary. So the heat from what's called the primary is transferred in a clever way to heat the fusion states of the bomb, which is known as the secondary, to produce very large uh, yield bombs. And this is known as the Teller-Ulam uh, uh, method. So now we've kind of discussed nuclear weapons and there's of course there's a lot more detail here than what I've discussed. Let's discuss nuclear weapon effects. So after the bombings, there was enormous devastation caused by multiple effects, such as the blast wave, the heat causing firestorms and radioactivity left over from the fission products. Um, a way of thinking about, or uh, in terms of what, you know, how the energy among the different effects uh, is divided, 
um, is to think of the total energy being the TNT yield of the bomb. And, and uh, thinking of the different things like blast wave, the thermal energy that's released, nuclear radiation, being partitioned in this way, where 50% is the, is the blast wave, so it's the energy from the shock waves, it's the energy compression or the pressure, 35% uh, is the thermal energy release. This is the electromagnetic radiation, um, which I will discuss. And 50%, 15% is the nuclear, uh, nuclear radiation, which I will also discuss. So if you, here's a picture of kind of a ground burst. And here you see a picture of a ground burst, which is an explosion conducted on the surface of the ground. And you can see a very faint line. I don't know if you can really see that, but you can see a very faint line of the shock front moving into the air that has not been disturbed yet by the blast wave. And there's a stark density difference between that space and the shock front, which is why you see the, the, the faint line. A way of thinking about it, this is a conventional explosion, um, which is a, really a very good um, kind of simulation that you would have in a nuclear explosion. You can see the reflection of the uh, mountain um, in this kind of dome, that, that the shock wave um, that moves outward. So you see the reflection of the mountain in the shock front itself. And this was a conventional explosion, uh, not a nuclear explosion, but that's because there's a huge difference in, uh, in density between the air that has been, uh, that's affected by the shock wave and the air that hasn't been affected yet. And so you have a difference in the index of refraction. And, and so that's why you see uh, the reflection in the, the shock front itself. Uh, but it's actually advantageous to explode a bomb at a certain height above the ground. And the reason is, is that the blast wave, which is essentially, as I said, it's kind of the pressure wave, reflects off the ground. And then the incident and reflected wave meet to produce an even larger pressure wave and do more damage. This is called the Mach stem. And when the blast wave is reinforced by the reflected wave, and you can kind of see that picture here where you see the reflection and then it meets the, uh, the, the, the initial wave um, that comes out. A good way to think about all of this is really in terms of uh, water on a pond or something or a ripple table or, or whatever. Um, of course, here we're talking about a three-dimensional uh, sphere that's moving outward, a shockwave that moves out in three dimensions. But you can think about trying to understand the physics in terms of uh, just a kind of two-dimensional uh, circular waves that when you throw a rock in stone or some, a stone in, uh, in water or something like that. So this is Alex Willerstein's nuke map, which you can easily find on the internet. And you can see what the difference are of nuclear explosions in any city. So you can type your favorite city and type it in there and see what the effects would be um, of a nuclear explosion. And we noticed something that's kind of interesting here is um, that you see this was, I kind of forgotten what the, what the actual effect is. I think it was 20 PSI pounds per square inch. So this is a, a dramatic, pretty dramatic effect um, on the environment for a 10 kiloton bomb on Monterey, this is where I live, and a 100 kiloton bomb. Uh, no, actually, that should be a 1,000 kiloton bomb uh, in Monterey. And so what you see is that the radius has moved out uh, about five times, but only five times. You'd think that if you have a bomb of 10 kiloton and then you have a 1,000 kiloton bomb or megaton bomb, that would be so dramatic that that radius would expand to much, much more uh, than a factor of five. It seems kind of counterintuitive. This is an important point. Well, it's not really. Um, and it's actually quite intuitive. If you think about the effect of a 10 kiloton bomb being like a small ball of a certain radius, imagine stuffing a balloon with 100 of those small balls. Right? Each ball represents 10 kilotons. So 100 of them corresponds to 1,000 uh, kiloton or megaton. The balloon itself won't expand out 100 times the radius. So it, it, it kind of does make sense. And there's you physicists who are interested in this, um, there is a kind of simple calculation, uh, more serious calculation, where you can set the kinetic energy of the shock wave um, equal to one half the TNT equivalent yield. And then you can kind of calculate and come up with this very interesting expression uh, of the size or yield of a bomb and related to the standoff distance and the pressure, which is the effect um, itself of the bomb. And then you'll find that this effect is, you know, when you compare it 100 times more yield, the effect is 4.6 times um, the radius. So it all makes sense. So about one third of the energy of an atomic bomb is in the form of light. It's like bringing a piece of the sun to the earth for a fraction of a second. Now the sheer brightness of the bomb can do grave damage. 
And in this case, the bullets, bullets are light uh, that concentrate energy like a magnifying glass. But in this case, there's no magnifying glass. So when you were young, you probably played with magnifying glass. I did to try to you know, make paper burn and something like this. In this case, no magnifying is necessary. There's so much, so much uh, energy that's been deposited on, uh, on materials like let's say grass or something that it will just um, start, to start to burn. So for example, uh, a 100 kiloton bomb can ignite grass at three miles and that's equivalent about five kilometers away. Um, and that's purely due to the energy that's deposited and, and uh, you reach a certain threshold and starts to burn. So here we see what happens when a bomb explodes nearby a house. Um, the se sequence begins with the house illuminated by the light of the explosion. And then as a fireball rises in the sky, the shadow gets shorter. You can kind of see that. And at the same time, the house starts to burn from the intense heat. The blast wave hits like thunder following lightning. And even if it blows out the fire, the electrical wires would be broken and gas lines, everything would be shattered and hot embers would restart the fires. You see how quickly this happens. Total destruction in, in less than three seconds. But that's not all. There are other effects which come from the fires. Uh, initial fires that are started by the thermal radiation combine and form what's called super fires. Um, we see this in California where you have these uh, massive forest fires and they combine and they produce even larger fires. They develop their own, uh, own weather conditions. Um, it's all very, very scary. Um, the firestorm developed in Hiroshima about 20 minutes after the explosion. That's how fast um, all this happened. There are also radiation effects, the effects from radioactive debris left over from the bomb. These are the fission products from the, from the fission process. So remember when I talked about fission and you get the splitting, then what, when you split the U-235 or the plutonium-239 or other isotopes, if you split them into two, then what you have left over are two pieces. And those tend to be, those are isotopes that tend to be radioactive often. Um, so the ones that are very well known uh, are uh, cesium-137 and strontium-90. They're a particular concern because they have half-lives for a very long time. They stay for 30 years um, around uh, and, uh, and, and that's a big concern. Um, the fallout clouds can travel for very, very long distances and also disperse uh, radioactive materials. So I just kind of touched on this because we only have 20 minutes, um, but there's many other effects which I've not discussed, which I kind of listed here. Um, but one of the questions that sometimes comes, comes up is, would international organizations be able to cope? So a recent study by the Norwegian Radiation Protection Agency found that adequate countermeasures to a nuclear detonation simply don't exist even given the vast resources that Norway has at its, at its disposal. No official UN organization mandate is there to deal with such an event. No specific United Nations or interagency planning or exercises have been conducted to really prepare for such a nuclear detonation. While I'm sure uh, uh, Dr. Moore will talk about this, there have been many radiological uh, um, incidents such as dirty bomb scenarios that have been planned for. So, this is my commentary, given how badly the COVID-19 pandemic has been handled by, by, by some countries, I wouldn't be surprised that the after effects and response to nuclear detonation would also probably not be handled um, very well. So that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a concern. So let's end here, which is the second book end, um, which the climactic effects of a small nuclear exchange. Um, so imagine a skirmish in Kashmir, uh, escalating due to poor communication, misunderstanding, panic, fear. Perhaps this time we're not so lucky. Um, Alan Robach and Owen Brian Toon have done some recent studies, and this is, goes back to about 2011, uh, about effects of a small-scale nuclear war of 100 Hiroshima-type weapons between India and Pakistan. And that's only 0.03% of nuclear weapons. Um, the effects are devastating, at least immediate 20 million deaths, but but that's not all. Um, the effects of a small nuclear exchange would be that massive amounts of smoke and soot from fires would rise into the upper atmosphere and would block the sun. And so sunlight would be reflected back into space. And you would get rapid, very large drops in global surface temperatures, and then get a collapse of basic life-sustaining ecosystems. So it's a, it's a very scary scenario. The growing season around the world would be shortened, uh, not allowing crops to reach maturity. This would lead to increase in the price of food. 
mass starvation, hoarding by countries that have funds. We already see this with vaccines, for example. It only seems that the rich countries have access to vaccines. Um, disease, war, competition for food. And according to the IPPNW, that's the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, 2 billion people would be at risk. So I want to end here. We, I think we all have a shared responsibility to prevent nuclear weapon use because we're all affected. So it's not a very optimistic note, but really a call for action to try to help prevent this um, ever uh, from happening in the future. So I have some, I, I won't go through this, but I have some resources here as well, um, which you might be interested in. So I think that's it. Be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, for Dr. Ferenc. We have a question in the Q&A. It's good to maybe answer now so that people get a better appreciation of the topic. So uh, Bushra Bustani asked, what kind of nuclear weapon has the DPRK tested so far or is, is assumed to possess? Okay, so that's a very good question. So it's not just the, the, the weapons themselves, the nuclear weapons themselves that are a concern. It is also the, um, the delivery systems that they use. So for example, when we, let's just talk about the nuclear weapons. So there have been six tests and the last test was a very, very large, large bomb. Um, it looks like it was about, it depends who you talk to, about 250 kilotons. So this is a really, really large, uh, large bomb. Um, we don't know what type of bomb it was, but most definitely it was a boosted bomb. Um, so uh, they have very powerful bombs and there's no reason that they haven't been mass producing these bombs. Um, but you don't just need the bombs, you also need to be able to deliver them. Uh, so this is delivery systems for nuclear weapons. So in the case of the North Korea, what they have are, are very long range and uh, powerful uh, missiles. So for example, they've, uh, they've demonstrated that they have ICBMs, so intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, that could potentially uh, be used uh, for, 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 um, for delivering a nuclear weapon. There's also other types of uh, missiles um, as well. Okay, um, we have quite, we're getting a very much more motivated audience that has questions for you, Dr. Ferenc. I'm Good. going to take them in order. So somebody asked if you could shed more light on the useful analogy of decay. Um, so I really like the bucket analogy and uh, I've looked this up. It actually works mathematically to a certain extent. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if you think about this, if you have something like natural, different types of uh, naturally occurring uh, radioactive material, uranium-235, uranium-238, uh, thorium-232, all kinds of different isotopes, they, they tend to decay in a series of decays. So if you think about, about it in terms of, um, you know, one is decaying from one bucket to the next bucket, to the next bucket, to the next bucket. If you, and that was my analogy, is that you have something that's decaying very quickly, then you can imagine that that spout is very, very thick so that the material can quickly go into the next bucket, the next isotope, right? And then if that isotope is going to be stable, there's no spout, so the bucket keeps on filling. And so you can imagine that this, can, this analogy can go very far where you have what's called branching decays, where you have uh, one decaying to say like one type of decay and then the same isotope decaying to other types of decays. Um, so this can be very, very uh, complicated, but this analogy is, is really a fun analogy from my point of view to, um, to describe the, the, the decay uh, process. Thank you. I'm going to field one more question and then the others, we'll try and see if we can get to them at the end of the session after the other presenters. Somebody asked, Bati Mango asked, what can African countries do to mitigate the risks and destruction that come from nuclear bombs? Is there any hope, nuclear bunkers, et cetera? Yeah, I wouldn't uh, bet on nuclear bunkers. I wouldn't invest any money in that. Um, but I think it's very important for 
for African countries to, to have power and speak up and become really uh, knowledgeable about this issue. What I've really tried to make clear is that this, the, with the last bookend, is that we all have a responsibility. Yes, only eight countries or whatever number of countries actually have nuclear weapons, um, but they have the potential to destroy your livelihood. It's not their livelihood. Uh, it's your livelihood because if if um, something as dramatic would happen as a nuclear exchange between two countries, then the climate would be affected and that affects you. So you have a responsibility. African countries, countries around the world have a responsibility to try to um, make their voices heard um, so that something like this uh, will not happen. That's how I would put it. Great question. I think that's a much more positive note than nuclear winter. We're all gonna die. <laughs> Some right. are gonna I like die, that so way. I like ending on that fast. note. <laughs> yes. Uh, advocate for yourselves as African countries, as citizens of the world, because you have a vested interest. And on that note, I'm gonna say thank you, Dr. Ferenc, for now. And I'm going to pivot to Dr. Moore, who is going to talk about radiological weapons and weapons of mass disruption. Just a little introduction about Dr. Moore. He is a senior, he was a senior analyst at the Office of Nuclear Security at the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, in Vienna. He is a licensed professional nuclear engineer, and he is also a lawyer and an aviation law expert. So I Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Moore. I will also add that Dr. Moore organizes a safeguards course every year for CNS that is free and incredibly useful. Dr. Moore, you have the floor. Thank you, Nomsa. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna talk a bit about radiological dispersal devices as weapons of mass disruption. Are, Nomsa, are you seeing my screen okay? Okay, all yes. right. So. Here's what we're gonna go over. What's a radiological dispersal device? Some people call it a radioactive dispersal device. Doesn't make any difference. The acronym that's normally used is RDD. What's the difference between an RDD and a dirty bomb? Is there a difference? Is an RDD a weapon of mass destruction? Why do some people call RDDs weapons of mass disruption? So we'll go through each of these. Basically, an RDD is a way of dispersing or harming people with radioactive material. Each type of radioactive material will emit some sort of radiation. It might be alpha particles, might be electrons, primarily gamma rays and X-rays, and some even emit neutrons. So some way, the person who wants to use an RDD has to get that material, get it out of control and disperse it. Might be with a crop dusting aircraft, might be even with a sprayer, might be dissolving it in the water supply of a town. Um, one type of device, which is um, really doesn't disperse, but usually is thrown into the RDD category is what we call a simple exposure device. If I had some radioactive material and I merely took the shielding off of it and put it under your chair where you're sitting, you would receive an exposure. And in fact, that might be the most lethal way of exposing someone to radiation. So a dirty bomb is taking some radioactive material and using some explosives to disperse it. In other words, an RDD is, one type of RDD is a dirty bomb. A dirty bomb is an RDD, but not all RDDs are dirty bombs. So you don't use the same terms synonymously. So. The idea is set off an explosion, disperse the material. And what happens here, hopefully, and I guess hope you can see this, here's an RDD explosion. What the perpetrator wants to happen is they want the material to get up and to be dispersed over an area. If there are people there, they might inhale it, they might ingest it. If you had enough of it, you might actually get some cloud shine of radiation, but these little dots here represent particles, particles of radioactive material, radioactive material that's adhered to other particles in the air. And this will 
the terrorist hopes disperse the radiation. There are a lot of problems with doing this in the real world. Um, explosives may not be the best way of doing this. In fact, there are a number of studies that show that burning the material uh, is a better way of dispersing it. But this area, and might be a major city, this area where the radioactive material falls has now become contaminated. And we talk about then aerial denial, uh, area denial, where the area has become contaminated and people, you don't want people to go into that area. So that's one of the major effects of a dirty bomb. So any type of RDD, are we talking about death? Well, for the most part, the answer is no. RDDs typically will never contain enough material unless it's kept together to be lethal. It's one of these odd things that when you disperse the material, it becomes less lethal because the dose from the radioactive material has been decreased. So you'll find a number of experts, particularly with a dirty bomb, who will say, look, the only people who are gonna be killed by a dirty bomb are the people who are killed by the explosives. In other words, when the explosives go off, there's some shrapnel, there's blast effects, that sort of thing. Uh, you might have some lethality there. Well, what about aerial den area denial? And what about financial loss? We'll come to panic later. How big an area can you contaminate? And how much damage can you cause? This is from a study, and I'll give you this, the, the Sandia study later. Uh, this is how many curies of activity for different types of material does it take to deny one square kilometer? Now, these, this involves some assumptions. I mean, each government uh, has, and there are some international standards about contamination. Uh, this is one that's used in the United States. We would clean up be forced to clean up things that are contaminated at a 20 millisievert. Sievert is a measure of uh, dose. So an area that can give you a 20 millisievert dose in a year basis uh, would have to be cleaned up. If we talk about cobalt 60, and this is a material that's present in Africa, um, about 10 curies of that will contaminate a, a square kilometer. For cesium-137, it takes more. Uh, cesium-137, the gamma ray that's emitted from this is less energetic than the two gamma rays which are emitted from cobalt-60. So for cesium-137, you need about 40 kilometers to contaminate, or excuse me, 40 curies to contaminate a square kilometer. Um, so you can easily, with reasonable size sources, and these are reasonable size sources that are in various parts of Africa, you can easily contaminate large areas, maybe 25 square kilometers, but those are things that assume that you can somehow uniformly spread the material. This is like spreading jam or peanut butter on a piece of bread. In reality, you can't do that. So, so when you, you have to be a little careful when you look at some of the estimates of how much area can be contaminated because some of the assumptions are that there's uniform spreading and in reality that never happens. Okay, how much does it cost? Well, there are several studies that are quoted here and I'll give you a link to this uh, uh, report. Uh, and these are big numbers. Uh, Canadian study looked at uh, dispersing a thousand curies of cesium-137 and that's a reasonable amount to have in a blood irradiator that you might find in a hospital. If you did that, the cleanup costs would be on the order of $50 billion. Now, I don't know whether those Canadian dollars or US dollars, but that's not too much different, regardless of what it is. Another one was a study of contamination in the port of Los Angeles, the Long Beach Harbor, about $34 billion and the loss of the port for a month to clean it up. Downtown Los Angeles, this is a Department of Homeland Security uh, study. Um, the event recovery costs, uh, we're talking large numbers, again, billions of dollars. So fortunately, although there have been a few incidents of the use of dispersal devices, uh, none of them have been significant. Uh, there's one in a park in uh, Moscow, the device was not detonated. It was just the material was put there. There are some uh, 
stories about devices in Chechnya. Um, and there's actually a very odd situation that occurred where uh, a person in Japan took a small drone and took some radioactive sand from Fukushima area and flew the drone with the sand onto the prime minister's residence. Uh, the prime minister wasn't there. Uh, this was not discovered for a day or two. And uh, finally they found it in the drone and arrested the guy. But we do have an accident that occurred. This is in Goiânia, Brazil, 1987. Uh, if you want to read more about this, you can look at the uh, IAEA report, the radiological accident in Goiânia. Uh, you can find that on the internet. Um, this was a, it's not a small town in Brazil. It's actually a pretty good sized town, but there, there was a medical source that got out. Um, some people broke into the uh, facility, stole the source, took it to a junkyard. Uh, the source was opened up. Uh, the people didn't know what they were dealing with. They didn't know they were dealing with radioactive material. Uh, they found some pellets in there that were kind of glowed in the dark. Um, they gave them to children. Uh, the result was pretty tragic. At least four people died uh, in, this, in the near term. Uh, There's a large economic loss um, in those days. And we're talking, we're getting 30 years ago, uh, a little more than 30 years ago, we're talking 30, $40 million cleanup costs. Homes were destroyed. 100,000 people had to be examined to see if they had become contaminated. So major, major result. And this is from a fairly small amount of material. Um, the other thing we should consider is the potential for sabotage to a facility. Now that's not classically an RDD, but it has the same effect. If you sabotage a facility, a nuclear reactor, a hospital um, device that has uh, uh, radioactive material in it and release the radioactive materials, the effect is the same. You get a dispersal and you can get these large area contaminations. Uh, this is in fact this um, publication that I took uh, some of these graphics from and which I've been quoting from. It's by Sandia Laboratories for the U.S. Department of Energy. The site, the website where you can download a PDF version of that is here. Uh, you'll have a copy of this presentation and you can uh, uh, take a look at that and see what it, uh, see what it looks like to you. Okay, what about the panic? psychological effects, fear, panic, post-traumatic stress disorder for people who've been exposed. Um, these are all very real effects and many times undervalued. One of the things, for example, that happened to Goiânia, Brazil, is that after that accident occurred, when they went to bury the people who, um, uh, who had died from radiation exposure, uh, some of whom had internal contamination. There was a near riot. The police had to put down a riot because many of the townspeople did not want these people buried in the same cemetery where their ancestors were buried. Um, other people in Brazil would not buy farm products from the Goiânia area. Big economic impact. Um, if you go back and you look there in Japan, uh, there have been several studies that show that people from Hiroshima and Nagasaki often disguise the fact that they are from or that their families were there during the time of the explosions because if they wanna marry someone from outside the area, the parents of those people may object to the marriage because they don't want their son or daughter marrying someone who descends from someone from Hiroshima or Nagasaki. So there are a lot of strange effects, but why, why do we have, you know, if we know about the risks of radiation, why, and we know that for the most part, RDDs are not, they're not like the weapons that uh, Ferenc was talking about. They're not gonna kill large numbers of people. They're not gonna spread for the most part, large amounts of contamination. Why do people fear these things? Well, it's really because we have, in the United States at least, and some places in Africa probably do a lot, of, lot better than we do on average, uh, we have very poor scientific education. You know, people think that uh, radiation is something that 
you know, if you're bitten by a radioactive spider, you become Spider-Man. Uh, if you're exposed, you become the Incredible Hulk. Uh, maybe some people would like to be the Incredible Hulk, but, uh, you know, he's a little bit scary. Or it creates monsters like Godzilla. So we just have this real disproportionate fear of things involving uh, radiation and radioactive material. Now, where does the material for these RDDs come from? Well, it's all over, and it's all over Africa. We have cobalt-60 irradiators. We have cesium-137 irradiators of various types, iridium-192, americium, beryllium neutron sources. These are very common. They're used in medicine. They're used in construction and product manufacturing. They're used in the oil and gas industry. Um, so the details of that, we could get into more depth of that if there are any questions about that. But these are used, and sometimes they're not properly disclosed by the people who bring them into the country. Um, you know, if you have good customs and border control, they should know about all sources that are being brought into your country, uh, but sometimes they're not. And these things are shipped by air, they're shipped by sea, they're shipped by truck, train, any form of transportation. And there are a lot of legitimate shipments of these materials. Um, but you worry about the illegitimate shipments. Okay, so let's go back and go over what we've gone through. What is an RDD? Well, dispersing. You know now that, excuse me. Hmm. Uh, about to sneeze. Um, you know that a dirty bomb is a type of RDD, uh, but it's not synonymous with an RDD. Uh, uh, someone could easily take uh, radioactive, particularly cesium, which is cesium chloride, is one of the normal forms of uh, the use of radioactive cesium. Cesium chloride physically not only looks like, but it acts like regular salt, which is sodium chloride. So if you've ever dumped salt into water, you know that it dissolves quite quickly, um, and so does cesium chloride. So you could take a cesium chloride source and dissolve it in a water supply or dissolve it in someone's uh, glass of wine or beer or something like that. RDD, it's not a weapon of mass destruction. Now, having said that, we have some legislation that says it is. But when we say, is it a weapon of mass destruction in this context, we are saying, is it something that's going to kill a lot of people, destroy a lot of property? The property damage could be high, but it's really probably not going to be very high. And it's certainly not going to kill very many people. So we prefer to think of this as a weapon of mass disruption. If an RDD goes off, there's going to be public outcry, maybe public panic. There's going to be fear. There's going to be economic loss. There's going to be some aerial denial and cleanup. And these things have to be worked through. So it's really a weapon of mass disruption. Some final points here, and I'll give you some time then for questions and maybe get us back on schedule. Even if the RDDs are not weapons of mass destruction, they are a threat in Africa. Uh, either intentionally, if a terrorist does this, or if you have an accident or incident similar to the one that happened in Goiânia, uh, just where something gets out of control and the population, people in the population get exposed. So what does that mean? It means that nuclear security and nuclear security culture, which includes a portion of nuclear security culture, uh, includes uh, all types of radioactive material and securing that properly. These are important issues for each country and for international and regional cooperation. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, adjacent countries and even countries that are somewhat removed need to cooperate on an international basis through Interpol, through IAEA, through any avenues that allow you to recognize that a radioactive material has gotten out of control. A couple of examples. Long time ago, and there's a research reactor in Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Two fuel rods were stolen from that reactor. 
Um, and these actually contain highly enriched uranium, which was the fuel for the trigger reactor at that time. One of them was seized in Italy. The other one's still missing. No one knows where that is. There have been uh, uh, loss of uh, well logging sources, uh, both downhole, uh, in other words, the well logging source. These are used in the oil and gas industry uh, to perform research. Uh, they drop the source down the borehole and read the, the reflection of the radiation to give them an, an idea of what the structure is like and how many, uh, how much there is in hydrocarbon, uh, therefore how much there is in oil. Um, uh, these have been lost in various points in, uh, in Africa. Uh, and once again, there is a lot of this material. So if you're at a regulatory agency, probably you know that, uh, hopefully you have a source list for your country and you know where everything is, you know who the licensees are. Uh, if you're a security person, uh, police or intelligence, we find often that people are not aware. They're not aware of what sources are at a hospital. Uh, they're not aware of what sources are being used in industry. And they need to become, that awareness uh, needs to improve. So uh, that's it for my presentation. I will give this to Margarita and to uh, uh, Jean Dupri. Um, and they can distribute it to you. Uh, I'm also available for questions. Uh, if you want, uh, take questions now, uh, or we can wait till the end. Nimsa, so back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. We have one question from an anonymous attendee. They're asking, why is a dirty bomb less lethal? Because it's spreading radioactive material after all. Well, it's because the dose that you receive from that radioactive material, when it's spread around, unless you happen to stand right near it for a long time, uh, that dose is gonna be very low. To see, well, let me back up a step. When we talk about dose, this is the radiation you receive in your body. And we measure that in sieverts on the international scale. The old, uh, the old scale we measure in rim, um, a dose of one sievert or a hundred rim, rink an equivalent man, uh, that dose is when you begin to see the symptoms of radiation sickness. In other words, people begin to lose hair, people begin to get nauseous and vomit and those things. A hundred sieverts is usually not, or excuse me, a hundred rim, hundred rim or one sievert. You can see the symptoms, but usually people recover from that. To get that kind of dose from a dispersal device would be very rare. So this is not like the amount of exposure that people get from a nuclear weapon like at Hiroshima or Nagasaki. This is a much lower dose. One of the concerns is receiving, remember, let's go back up here. Um, if we have these people here and they inhale or ingest the material, that can be more of a long-term problem. But typically the amount that they could inhale or ingest would be very, very low compared to what they would get from exposure from a nuclear weapon. So probably not lethal, maybe, uh, maybe a little bit life shortening. In other words, if your average lifespan is 70 years, uh, you might lose a couple of months on average in lifespan. These are what we call the stochastic effects of radiation. Uh, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. It's going to be very long term and it's going to be somewhat probabilistic. So hopefully that answers that question. You have any others on the Yes, uh, Ijoma had asked basically about the impact on your genetics if you've been exposed to radioactivity from a radiological dispersal dis device. I think you sort of covered it. Well, yeah, there, there can be genetic effects. I, I don't wanna say that there are no genetic effects, but as all of us sit here, as I sit here in Monterey, as people sit in Africa, there's a variance depending on where you're sitting. You are being struck about somewhere between three and 5,000 times per second by radiation that comes from our normal environment. Now, why are you not keeling over and dying from cancer? I mean, we're getting hit all these, you know, 
you're just being hit all the time. Well, the reason is because we developed, the human race developed in a sea of radiation. Our immune system is used to going around and fixing and repairing our DNA from this radiation damage. Now, sometimes it can't, sometimes it fails, particularly as we get older. So cancers do exist and they become more prevalent. But these are natural phenomena. So there can be genetic mutations. Uh, they're not very prevalent, even from the nuclear weapons at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, you don't see uh, one of the things that happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, for example, for pregnant women. There were a lot of natural, well, not natural, there were radiation-induced abortions. In other words, the fetus was damaged. The fetus died in utero. Uh, women had spontaneous abortions. What you did not see are Godzilla-like creatures being born or people with large amounts, uh, you know, with, with perceptible birth defects. Now contrast that to, there was a pregnancy anti-nausea uh, drug called thalidomide, which was given to women in the 1960s, 70s. I might be off a little bit in the time frame, but it was a new drug and it seemed to many women get, you know, they get sickness. They, they feel sick and nauseated as a function of pregnancy. So doctors gave this to people. Well, what happened when they started seeing some of the results were these are the people that you see horribly sometimes deformed with little tiny arms or missing parts. These are thalidomide babies. And it wasn't in every instance, it, but there was a significant percentage of thalidomide babies. We don't see that from radiation. We don't, they don't see those types of results but there could be some genetic inheritance of damaged DNA uh, that could exist, but it's not considered a, a big problem, okay? Again, we are creatures born in radiation and there's a lot of it around. Other so questions? Much. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. Um, there, I'm basically going to be, I'm going to combine these two questions, these last two questions I have for you, which is, one was, are there significant amounts of radioactivity present in explosions used by terrorists? That was from Rose Onoja. And somebody was also asking about, I think it's connected because they're saying, how can we check or ensure better like internal nuclear security and safety because these threats are triggered by staff or workers from within a nuclear plant, so people who have access. Okay, well, let me get a little bit on my old IE. IAEA soapbox. Um, the IAEA is an organization that has limited funding. And so how do you get how do you get the training that you need in your country from the IAEA? Well, we have a saying in English, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So you got to be the squeaky wheel. Every year at the general conference in September for the IAEA, um, most countries participate. Um, some participate very aggressively. They make arrangements beforehand. They seek out the office of, well, it used to be the Office of Nuclear Security. Now it's a division of nuclear security. And they say, we want to come in and meet with you to discuss what you're going to do for us. And those are the ones that get attention. The ones who merely show up for the conference and sit and listen and don't say anything, they don't get much attention. You get what you ask for. And again, there's a priority list and that priority list, you know, somewhere down the chain, there's no more funding and you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get taken care of. So you can get all the publications from the IAEA about nuclear security. Those are free. You can download every one of them except nuclear security series one. You have to petition to get that, but it's not hard to do. Uh, that contains uh, details of radiation uh, detection equipment, and it was considered a little bit sensitive. We didn't want to tell people how good or bad the equipment was uh, that's out there. But all the others you can get, um, and you can get the training, and there's online training that's available. So that's one of the best ways. Also, Interpol, the 1540 Committee, all of those international groups 
do training, uh, go to areas. Uh, I go with Interpol. I've been to Morocco. I've been to, uh, with 1540 to Botswana, to uh, Kenya, to uh, Cairo. Uh, so you can get these people to come to your country to do the type of training. Uh, you can also, um, uh, you can also participate in, in many international organizations. Many international organizations can fund participation. Uh, one of the things that happens, um, and you may not know this, uh, for the Nuclear Security Fund for the IAEA, some of the donations to the Nuclear Security Fund <clears throat> come targeted. In other words, they will say, uh, you can use this to buy equipment uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's all you can use it for. That's a problem for the IAEA because they can't just say, here's where the need is, we wanna spend your money. Uh, and sometimes you can negotiate that. But again, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Find out who it is who does things at the IAEA, make contact with them. There's not only the nuclear security group at the IAEA, there's also the um, technical coordination, TC, has a, a head for African development. Those are the people who uh, pass out uh, uh, medical devices and things like that. Uh, get to know who those are. Your government should know who they are. They should be dealing with them. If you don't have a mission in Vienna, which a lot of countries don't, then develop some liaison. With this kind of communication, you can be talking to those people, you know, once a day would be a lot, uh, once a week might be a lot, but at least once a month, you can touch base with them and say, when are you going to get down here and give us some help about this? Or I've got a really good young person who I'd like to send to IAEA. Is there funding available to send them either for an internship or a job available? Uh, you know, do those things, but be proactive. That's my soapbox and now I'll get off it. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. That was incredibly good advice that I think all countries and people who represent their countries need to hear because sometimes I think as someone who has worked in diplomacy, people get a little bit shy and they think that it's not their place to, but you know, these organizations exist to help and assist countries. So that's great advice. And on that note, I'm going to segue to Jill Lester. She is the resident expert on chem and bio uh, weapons and security and safety for the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies. She supports multiple projects related to nonproliferation, machine learning, public health, so One Health Security and biological security and safety. She has worked on WMD programs with a focus on Iran, dual use commodity proliferation, and um, she has also worked with the American Department of Defense. Jill, you have the floor. Thank you. I'm really pleased to be here today and um, I have the unenvi unenviable position of following such wonderful presentations, but um, I'll do my best. Uh, I'm just going to, in the interest of time, jump right in here. Um, biological weapons are disease causing organisms, organisms like viruses, bacteria, fungi, and other toxins that produce, that are produced and released deliberately to cause disease to death um, in humans, animals, or plants. Um, it's important to remember there are two parts to a biological weapon. You have to have the weaponized agent and you have to have a delivery system. Um, in the past, agents have often been enhanced to make them more virulent, um, easier to mass produce, store, and disseminate. Delivery mechanisms span a wide range and have included missiles, bombs, hand grenades, rockets and spray tanks fitted to aircraft cars, trucks, and boats. Biological weapons have strategic and milita uh, tactical military applications. They have also been used for political assassinations and to infect livestock and agriculture to create uh, food, shortage food shortages and cause economic loss. 
The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, classifies agents into three categories. Category A are the highest priority agents posing increased risks because they can be easily transmitted from person to person. They result in high mortality rates. They have potential for major public health impacts. They can cause public panic and social disruption, and they require special action for public health preparedness. These are some examples of category, age, category A agents as determined by the CDC. Um, when I was in graduate school, we were required to memorize bioagent characteristics. And those are the degree of person-to-person -person transmission, infective dose, incubation period, the duration of illness, um, case fatality rate, persistence of the organism outside of the host, and vaccine efficacy. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to memorize those characteristics, but what I um, want you to take away from the discussion is that um, those bioagent bio characteristics, characteristics are what make agents effective, albeit scary, biological weapons. Anthrax um, is, has long been considered one of the most likely agents for biological weapon, or for use as a biological weapon, um, and it has been um, used in the past as a biological weapon. Uh, what I want to draw to your attention here to here on this slide is the, the gentleman in the bottom corner. He is standing on an island that is um, off the coast of Scotland. Um, that island was used during World War II to test bombs filled with anthrax on livestock and the spores of anthrax persisted for decades, so over 40 years and um, the island ultimately needed to undergo decontamination procedures to be safe for um, humans to visit. Um, another important thing to remember about anthrax is it's not transmissible human to human, so that's a, that's a good thing. Um, plague, in terms of biological weapons, pneumonic plague is, the, um, is the, the type of plague that we're most concerned with. It is, um, pneumonic plague is an extremely high fatality rate. Um, you can also um, have secondary spread from person to person, and there is a low infectious dose. Um, at the top here, you have some, some pictures of some symptoms of people who um, have um, unfortunately be infected with, with plague, and I'm, I'm sorry, they're not super pleasant to look at. Um, tularemia is one of the most infectious pathogenic bacteria known. Um, inhalation as of as few as 10 organisms can cause disease, and it has substantial capacity to cause serious illness and death. Um, in, in 1970, the World Health Organization had a, an assessment, and they asserted that in a worst case scenario, the dissemination of 50 kilograms of uh, tularemia as an aerosol cloud over a city of 5 million people would um, be estimated to have uh, 250 incapacitating casualties and include 19,000 de deaths. Um, but luckily, like anthrax, tularemia is not known to be transmissible human to human. Um, smallpox does um, spread person to person and it does have a high fatality rate. Um, it has been used as a biological weapon in the past. Um, albeit quite, quite, quite a while ago during the French and Indian um, Wars of 1754 to 1776. But during that time, British soldiers distributed smallpox infected blankets to Native Americans. Um, in the 1980s, the Soviet Union developed variola, um, which is the virus, the causative agent of smallpox as an aerosol biological weapon and produced tons of virus-laden material annually, and that was intended to be inserted into intercontinental ballistic missiles for delivery. 
Um, smallpox is the only human infectious disease ever to be completely eradicated. It was the last naturally occurring case was in Ethiopia in 1977, and the World Health Organization declared it eradicated in 1980. So routine vaccinations ceased at that time. And what that means is today the, the bulk of the world population has no immunity to, to smallpox. The, um, the variole of virus, uh, again, the causative agent that causes um, smallpox remains stored in only two, two locations in the world. Um, one of those is in Russia and one is in the United States. Um, viral hemorrhagic fevers, um, some have the potential for causing widespread health or excuse me, illness and death. Um, the important takeaway here for you is that um, some viral hemorrhagic fevers, if attacks were used, those could affect both human and animal population. Um, I quickly just wanted to show you this list. These following countries have had or have been suspected of having biological weapons programs. Luckily, it's um, only 16 countries and Taiwan. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time today to cover all of them. But I do want you to um, take away that not all of these programs were equal in terms of size, funding, aspirations, and capability. Um, but the secrecy behind a lot of these programs led to the misconceptions about what other programs um, were capable and the other programs intended, which um, led to the you know, fueled the race to develop capabilities. Um, as well, there's an ongoing concern that terrorist groups will or have pursued biological weapon capabilities. Some groups have stated a desire or an intent to acquire biological weapons, and some groups have tried to develop weapons. Um, I just want to briefly go over an example of a group that um, did develop anthrax or attempted to develop and, and deploy anthrax as a weapon. Om Shinrikyo is a, or was a religious cult in Japan and um, they had significant resources. So experts, lab space, money and funds and they pursued both biological and chemical weapons for years. Um, in this particular instance in 1993 during June and July, a mist was seen emanating from the cooling towers on the uh, headquarters of Amshirikyo. And unfortunately, these pictures aren't great, but you can sort of see a, a cloud or a mist coming out of the, of the top of the building. It was described as a gelatin-like oily gray to black fluid. Um, people in the surrounding areas reported short-term loss of appetite, nausea, and vomiting. Um, What's interesting is that at the time, this wasn't attributed as a biological attack. Um, and then that probably has to do with the fact that people didn't think Om Shinrikyo was capable or willing to use anthrax. Um, but it could have been a lot worse. Um, it, it wasn't as bad as it could have been because the um, they used a strain of uh, and bacillus anthracis was actually um, a vaccine strain. There was also very low spore concentrations. Um, their, effect, their method for dispersal was also ineffective. Um, another case of using anthrax as a biological weapon are the so-called amerithrax letters. These were sent one week after the September 11th attacks in September 2001. Five letters were sent. Um, they resulted in five deaths and 17 individuals were sickened. Um, it also resulted in a massive investigation led by the Federal Bureau of Investigation that lasted over or nearly nine years in an effort to determine or attribute the attack to um, the, the sender. Um, 10,000 witnesses were interviewed over um, there were over 6,000 pieces of potential evidence. Uh, nearly 6,000 environmental samples were taken from 60 locations. And over 40, billion, or 40 buildings, excuse me, required some type of cleaning or decontamination. 
it's estimated that the cost of the cleaning and decontamination was over 320, 320 million uh, US dollars, and that's 2001 dollars. Um, but it did lead to some new scientific methods in bioforensics for the, the ability to attribute the attack. And it did lead to um, some developments in decontamination methods. But um, to put it in perspective to you, for you, the amount of anthrax that was sent in the five letters is equivalent to um, a sugar packet. So I have this, it's very small, it'd be hard for you to see. It's a sweet and low packet, not sugar, but um, it's about a gram. and. Um, it caused all of that, all of that damage and um, panic. Um, I just briefly wanted to mention the Biological Weapons Convention. It's a treaty that outlaws biological arms. Um, I think it's important to note that while the BWC prohibits the use of biological and type of toxin weapons, it does not ban the use of them. It also does not ban biodefense programs. And there's no international verification regime and also does not have its own organization to implement the convention. Um, I've borrowed this slide from Dr. Rich Pilch, who is the director of the Chem and Biological Nonproliferation Program here at CNS. And what we're trying to convey with this is that bio, to make a biological weapon, you need to have the right people with the right information. You need to have the agent and you need the technology. Um, the agents I've discussed today fit in the row labeled historical. But the new row highlights how we have to expand how we think about the potential routes for the development of biological weapons. Um, and I know that's a really quick overview, but given the time, I'm going to move right into chemical weapons. Um, similar to biological weapons, chemical agents um, also are, uh, consist of two parts, the, the, the weapon and, or the agent and, and the delivery uh, method. Um, for, bio, for chemical weapons, delivery methods fall into two broad categories. Again, these are very similar to the biological weapons delivery methods. So point sources or otherwise known as, or, or examples of point sources would be uh, grenades, mines, artillery shells, and warheads delivered via, via missiles. And then the other examples are line sources, so sprayers attached to moving vehicles or aircraft. Um, chemical weapons are broken out into uh, five categories, which I will briefly cover in the following slides. Um, choking agents, two well-known examples of choking agents are chlorine gas and phosgene gas. Um, the dispersal method typically is, as you can see here, a, a gas cloud. These inflict injury mainly on the respiratory tract. Um, they irritate the nose, the throat, and especially the lungs. When these are inhaled, it causes the lungs to secrete fluid and essentially drowns those who are affected. Um, the next group are blister agents. These are the are one of the most common types of chemical weapons. Um, they are typically an oily substance that act via inhalation or, or um, skin contact, and they can affect the eyes, the respiratory tract, and skin. It sort of starts as an irritant, and then it turns into a, a cell poison. Um, people often develop large and life-threatening <laughs> blisters that resemble severe burns. Um, it can result in blindness and permanent dam damage to the respiratory system. And while they often produce high number of casualties, they don't necessarily produce the high number of deaths, although they can. Um, blood agents. These um, agents mainly inhibit the ability of cells to use oxygen, so effectively causing the body to suffocate. Um, and these agents are distributed via the blood and generally enter the body through inhalation. Um, so a dispersal method would be, would be gas. Um, and then finally we have, or not finally, we, we have nerve agents. And nerve agents debilitate the nervous system. It causes muscle contra contraction, loss of control over bodily functions, and death within, within minutes. Um, they're highly toxic with rapid effects, 
and they're primarily absorbed through skin and lungs. Nerve agents can be um, further divided into two main groups. They're known as the G-series agents and the, and the V-series agents, and those were named for their, mil for their military designations. Um, G some um, G agents um, are persistent in the environment for short periods of time, and others are persistent for longer periods of time. Uh, the V agents are extremely potent. Uh, you only need a f uh, milligrams to cause death, and they do persist for long periods of time in the environment. Riot control agents are considered chemical um, weapons if they're used as a method of warfare, but states can legitimately possess them. And the effects are usually, the effects are usually tear, tears, coughing, um, irritation to the eyes and nose, and they constrict the airway. Again, just wanted to briefly mention the Chemical Weapons Convention or as its um, full name, the Convention of the Prohibition of the Development, Production, Stockpiling, and Use of Chemical Weapons and on their destruction. I, I think it's important to note that this um, convention has near universal, has been, is near universally adopted. And um, it is the first multilateral disarmament agreement for the elimination of an entire category of weapons of mass destruction. I would encourage you to visit the website of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. They have some really wonderful resources and information. And I think if you received um, some of the videos that I recommended, um, if you had a chance to view them, some of the, the videos are, are really um, great at helping to understand the, the effects, um, both physical and psychological, of the use of chemical weapons. Um, these countries declared chemical weapon, weapons stockpiles. All of the countries here, except for the United States, um, have um, finished the destruction of their stockpiles. And uh, the US is um, promising to finish our destruction by 2023. Um, again, I just wanted to highlight a few more recent instances of the use of chemical weapons. Om Shinrikyo, I think this has probably had for a long time been one of the most well-known uses of chemical weapons. Um, again, Om Shinrikyo, they used sarin in 1995. Um, it was six liters of sarin carried in plastic bags. Um, they uh, punctured the bags with umbrellas. 12 people were killed, over a thousand were injured and over 5,000 people needed medical care. Um, I just wanted to quickly mention the Islamic State, um, like many terrorist organizations before it, they have declared their, they declared their intent or the desire to develop or acquire um, weapons of mass destruction. And the reason I flag this as a point of interest is that in 2015, they combined chemical warfare agents with a projectile delivery system, which is the first time that we have um, observed that. And um, there have been some real concerns around the erosion of the norms of using chemical weapons, um, both in warfare and out, you know, outside of conflict zones. And these examples of recent assassination and attempted assassinations highlight the, um, the continued erosion of those, those norms. Um, uh, just quickly, because I know we're really tight on time. Uh, in 2017, VX was used in 2018 and in 20, uh, and as recently as 2020, Novichok, um, which are, Novichok are, I should say, are nerve agents. They were used um, in both the UK and Russia. And finally, because I really do not have time to do this justice, I would encourage you to visit the, uh, the website of the Global um, Partnership. Oh, so sorry, I, I can post the link or have the, the link posted for you. It's, it's the Global Partnership, I'm oh, sorry, Global Public Policy Institute. And they've just done some really amazing work on detailing all of the attacks in Syria starting in, December 2012, and um, but they don't always only just um, highlight the, the the timeline. They talk about um, the the 
the psychological effects and the effort or the pattern of use of the chemical weapons there. And just to point out that both sarin and chlorine have been confirmed. Um, the majority of attacks have been with, with chlorine. And just some <laughs> final thoughts quickly again, because I want to be respectful of your time. Um, both biological and chemical weapons are indiscriminate by nature. Um, they're difficult to defend against. There's psychological effects, political effects. Um, when I was in graduate school, uh, my professors often talked that or told us that biological weapons gram per gram are the most destructive of the weapons of mass destruction and um, chemical weapons have the dubious um, honor of being the weapons most used during the 20th and 21st century. So anyway, I know that was a quick overview, but it's just trying to uh, be respectful of your time and I uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Jill. That was a great run through. It took me back to the science and tech classes that I took for the degree. We have a lot of questions. So I am glad that we had a quick overview and I can let you know, I'm sure it's no surprise. Most of the questions are about COVID-19. So I'm going to summarize these questions into one bigger question. So first of all, the main question was, is COVID a biological weapon? Was it something that has been released intentionally? And also, if so, does it qualify in category A given its effects? And um, there was another question about COVID here. Yes, um, what is the plan to condemn countries of the release of a biological weapon such as COVID? Okay, <laughs> those are a lot of good questions. Um, COVID-19, um, I think I belong in the group or there's, you know, there's a lot of debate over whether it was intentional or is accidental or a, a natural um, occurring virus. I. I do not believe that it was intentional. Um, I, I think I'm in good company with that, but there are a lot of people who, who, who disagree with me on that. I would not necessarily categorize it as a category A agent, um, but I, I think you could argue that you that it could be. Um, and in terms of condemning, if it, if it is determined to have been in, intentional, I... <laughs> I think that the outcry will be um, substantial. I think there will be, um, you know, a lot of people asking the UN to 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 make statements um, decrying that. But I don't. I don't. I should emphasize again that I do not believe it is intentional. I I know uh, Dr. Rich Pilch, who's also at the center, does not believe it is intentional. But I I can understand why some people um, might think that it is. Could you shed just a little light on what helps you determine whether it's intentional or not? I think it's important. Um, yeah, sure. So uh, I actually should turn um, should flag for you the, the paper that um, I only had a, a small part in it, but um, Miles Pomper and, and Rich Pilch put together a paper and I'm, I'm not sure if somebody could post a link into the into the chat, but it is, um, it is a discussion of how when an incident like this happens, you need to go back and look at uh, or try to determine the source. And it's very unlikely that you'll ever get to like patient zero or, you know, the animal or where the, the crossover came from human into animal. If it, it, it was natural, um, you might be able to determine the lab that it came from. It, this is a lot of, there's a lot of difficulty with the attribution. Um, that's sort of why I wanted to highlight the Marathax letter um, example is that um, you, <laughs> it, it's a painstaking investigation to determine um, whether something came um, or you know was intentional or, or not intentional. Um, but there there are some factors, and um, just given the, given the time, I would uh, say that that paper might really help you because it was it's a step by step process for for evaluating that. 
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I can think we can all understand why people are so fractious about this uh, <laughs> disease. So I wanted to, uh, Chid Chidima Azike wanted to ask, what do you mean by gram for gram when you said biological weapons were more danger, were more more destructive gram for gram? So what I mean by that is you need less of biological weapons than you need of chemical or or nuclear weapons um, to cause more more damage. So that that's just what I meant by that. Okay. And someone had we had a few questions about smallpox, and the main one of the questions was why do Russia and and I think the person meant to say the United States still have samples of smallpox. Um, because even though it was eradicated naturally, it was determined at the time that it was important to continue to um, conduct research um, and to be able to, um, should, you know, should the eradication have not actually been a real eradication, we would need to um, ramp up vaccine production again. Um, and so it, it also um, really probably has a lot to do with the fact that the eradication happened in 1980 during the, you know, the height of the Cold War and um, neither Russia nor the United States was really willing to um, not have access to the variola virus. So um, I can um, let you know that those two um, storage facilities are inspected um, every two years to ensure that the virus is being kept safely and that the, um, the research is appropriate research. So there, there is that positive. Okay. Um, I, there, you know, there's a lot of questions here for you. Zainab Bella wants to know what is the political effect of biological weapons? Um, the political effect. Um, well, I think that, you know, there's, there's just so many political <laughs> effects. Um, you know, there's, there's the distrust of the other nations. If, if they, if it is proved to be a nation state, there's distrust of the population uh, for is their government parties. Um, you know, there's, uh, as I think it was Ferenc mentioned, you know, it's, if these are used, um, it's not going to be just confined, they, these, these know no borders. So it won't be confined to just one country on another country. So, um, you know, it has, uh, as COVID-19, even though I don't think it is a biological or uh, was used as a biological weapon, um, there's just so many cascading effects after the use, you know, economic, um, <laughs> there's a myriad of political effects, so. Okay. Um, this is going to be our last question because we are already eight minutes over. Dr. Olivia Elhefnawi wants to know, do you think chemtrail is a type of chemical weapon? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Do you think chemtrail is a type of chemical weapon? Hmm. I don't know what chemtrail is. I am not sure either. I, I really must admit that I'm more of a biological than chemical expert. So I, um, while I did have to memorize all the biological weapons, <laughs> I did not have to memorize all of the chemical weapons. But um, if, if you could maybe send that to me in chat, I could okay. um, try to uh, uh, confirm and, and get back to you at, uh, for, to answer the question for the participants at a later time. Okay, thank you so much, Jill. I'd like to take this moment to thank everybody, including our participants for the very lively questions and back and forth. I want to thank Dr. George Moore and Dr. Ferenc for being here with us this morning. I think our attendees got an incredibly great introduction into weapons of mass destruction. And I think I will hand it over to Jean Dupre now. Thank you. <laughs>